And did the topic of Jennifer Doulos' disappearance come up? Yes. Who brought it up? Michelle. And do you recall what the defendant said to you about Jennifer Doulos' disappearance? Yes, so Michelle was upset that um, um, her and her daughter pictures were posted by the news online. Um, and she said, uh, I'm, I'm going to kill that when she's going to turn up. And um, I said, don't say that. And she said uh, um, that she's going to be suing the news. She's writing down who posted what, what pictures. And I believe at that time, Dulos walked out of the um, um, dining room door, and then he was asking us. It like became awkward. He asking us, well, what are you guys doing? And, and Michelle said, uh, nothing. We're just talking. Like, and this is how the conversation ended. And Mr. Kameni, um You've recently disclosed that conversation, is that correct? Yes. Why did you decide to recently tell my office about that conversation? I, um, you know, those things, I, I didn't think people say those kind of things and they don't mean it. And, um, and I just, I was just wanted to minimize my involvement in all this. When you say minimize your involvement, what do you mean? Like, like I said, I, I don't, I didn't think that, that I was supposed to say those kind of things, I guess. Did there come a point in time that same week where you had a conversation with Mr. Dulos about your vehicle? Yes. Do you recall what day this was? I don't. With uh, ever since I gave police my my phone, I I basically couldn't recover exactly the dates and and times of of what things happened when. Um, Can you give us an estimate as to when this conversation took place? I believe it was either. Tuesday or Wednesday. Tell the jury, um, firstly, where that conversation took place. At Fort Jefferson. Why did you go back to Fort Jefferson? I, um, when I switched cars on Monday, I left my truck at Fort Jefferson and I forgot to take um, uh, my vape charger from that truck. Okay. And were you able to develop any prints that were suitable for comparison? One impression was suitable for comparison. How many impressions did you find overall? Two. Okay. Um, and incidentally, before I show this, 88-1, which was the bag all of these items were found in, or two bags, were those processed also for impressions of value? Yes, they were. And were you able to locate any? No. Okay. So at this point, I'm, I would like to show um, the last one. So can you explain to the jury, this is for the record, a photo entitled Lab 88.1, LP1, and LP2. <coughs> Could you just indicate for the jury what we're looking at? Maybe if you want to step up to the television. Okay, this is the underside or adhesive side of the black tape that was attached to both of the bags. And it said Tour de France on this piece of tape. There are two impressions that were developed. One impression, marked L1, was insufficient for comparison, and L2 was sufficient for comparison. And how were you able to develop these particular prints? With a reagent called a wet WAP. It's a wet reagent that we brush across the surface, rinse it off with water, and then those impressions were developed. And just so the record is clear, this photograph actually has the letters L1 with an arrow and L2 with an arrow. That's what you were pointing at when you were referring to the respective latent impressions. Is that correct? Correct. Now, you've also indicated that latent print number two 
was sufficient for comparison. Yes. Who did you compare latent print number two? Let's write that. It's a bad question. Um, which individual did you attempt to compare latent print number two to? Forrest Dulos. All right. And um, I'm just going to ask if we can pull up the photograph. First of all, how did you do this comparison? Just side by side comparison, assessing the latent print developed on the tape, which is L2, versus the known impressions of the fingerprint card marked for the Stulos. And did you take a photograph of that comparison? Yes. All right. Now, you've indicated that you did a side by side comparison. Can you just indicate, and I'll just indicate for the record, that this photograph is entitled Lab 88.1. L2 comparison to Dulos. Could you tell the jury what we're looking at here? This is our comparison chart. On the left side would be L2 developed off of that piece of tape we marked earlier. On the right side would be the left ring finger off the fingerprint card marked for the Dulos. The black lines correspond to the friction ridges. The white areas correspond to the valleys between your ridges. The red dots correspond to the rich characteristics that lie within both impressions as well. The purple lines are forming the uh, ridge flow as well around those characteristics. Now, what was your conclusion with respect to latent print two to Mr. Dulos? Latent print number two was inconclu inconclusive, excuse me, to the left ring finger of Ordos Dulos. And can you just indicate for the jury when you say inconclusive, what does that mean again? That means that there's a minimal agreement between the ridge flow, which are the black lines, and the red dots, the corresponding ridge characteristics. However, due to the quality of the latent print, we cannot conclusively say that it is the source or not. All right. Thank you, sir. Well, primarily, it is the road Jefferson Crossing in the area of Farmington to the west. I'm going to use directions northeast, southwest to the west. Is Eli Road, Jefferson Crossing, you know, runs east, west into a cul de sac. Um, there's okay. seven homes on Jefferson Crossing. Uh, it's a private road. We have scroll. a homeowners association. Well, I'm going to scroll in a little bit. Is your residence depicted on this? It is. Could you please point to it? Okay. And Jefferson Crossing? This is Jefferson Crossing down to the cul de sac. And the road to the left, please, going, I guess, north and south? From here down is Eli Road. Okay. And, sir, where's Ford Jefferson Crossing? Ford Jefferson Crossing is right here. Now, sir, you indicated this was a, a housing, houses built by Fotos Dulos. Did you also have a housing association? We did. We had a homeowners association. Okay. If you wouldn't mind having a seat. <clears throat> <clears throat> Who was involved in the homeowners association? Well, all the homeowners were members of the association. Could I at least have a timeline, Your Honor? This is now what found the foundation, at least in terms of when was involved. Sure. Um, we'll start with 2000, around the time period of 2017. 2017. Yes, sir. Um, there were all the residents of Jefferson Crossing were members of the homeowners association. Including Photos Dulos? including photos doulos. And did you have meetings? We did. And where were the meetings held? Uh, up until 2019, we had those meetings in photos' offices at Fort Jefferson Crossing. Prior to 2017, would Jennifer attend those meetings? She would. And after 2017, did she attend any of those meetings? So the meetings were usually held in the beginning of each year. So it would be in the beginning of 18, beginning of 19. Etc. So she did not attend the meeting in the beginning of 18. Now, in 2017, did you learn that Jennifer had left Fort Jefferson Crossing in Photos Dulos? I did learn that, yes. Prior to 2017, uh, what would you characterize your relationship with Jennifer Dulos as? Very friendly. I mean, they were, Jennifer was a great neighbor. Our kids attended the same school. We saw them at school functions. Uh, the kids played. We, we saw them uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, we saw them out and about. We had uh, gone to their home for Greek Easter, as an example. They came to our home for 
like an Oscar viewing party. We went out to dinner with him a couple of times in West Hartford Center. So, you know, neighborly. Hmm. Uh, did you ever meet Michelle Traconis? I did. When did you meet Michelle Traconis? In August of 2017. Could you please explain that first meeting? Yes. Um, Fotis called and asked if he could come over for a drink to introduce us to Michelle. Michelle, you see, was moving into Fort Jefferson Crossing. And Michelle also had a daughter that was my daughter's age, and they were going to be attending the same school. So Fotis wanted to introduce Michelle uh, and her daughter to our family um, as a way to get into the neighborhood, to get to know the neighborhood. And when was that? It was in August of 2017. Now I'm going to draw your attention to Memorial Day weekend of 2019. Okay. Uh, did you learn that Jennifer had been missing since May 24th? Uh, I learned uh, mid-morning on the 25th that Jennifer was missing. How did you learn that information? Well, in the early morning of the 25th, um, a neighbor had called me before. Objection, it, hearsay. Well, the state is probably not offering for the truth, but to indicate how this witness came to know about Jennifer Dulos being missing, overruled. In the early morning of the 25th, a neighbor uh, had called me on my cell phone, which during the work week would not be unusual, but on a Saturday it would, um, alerting me to the fact that an unmarked Farmington police officer was on the road. Um, and, and he had no indication as to why he was on the road. Um, and he asked him, but the Farmington police officer would not tell him. Um, later that morning, as I mentioned before, we moved from New Canaan to Farmington. Friends from New Canaan had sent my wife a news article. Objection, hearsay. Overruled. Okay. If you can, sir, is that how you learned about Jennifer Dulos being missing? That's correct, from a news article, correct. Okay. Did there come a point in time during the trip where Mr. Dulos told the group that he had taken the children to an adult club? Yeah. Who was present for this conversation? Myself and Jennifer. How did Jennifer react upon hearing this? She like shocked because they were little and they were going to a day club. Um, and so she was like, we were both kind of like disgusted, I guess is the word. And what was Mr. Doulos' demeanor like as he was relaying this information? He was excited that he like paid off the people to let his kids into this day club where, yeah, he seemed really happy about it. And approximately how long did you guys stay in Colorado? It was about a week. And at some point, did you travel to Miami? Yep. And I assume you flew? We flew, yeah. And who went to Miami? So myself, the five kids, Jennifer, Fotis, and then Jennifer's mom, Gloria, met us um, in Miami. And where did you stay in Miami initially? Initially, we stayed at the W um, Hotel there. And describe some of your daily activities in Miami. I assume you're not skiing anymore. Yeah, no snow skiing, but there was water skiing. So okay. they went from snow skiing and they went to Miami to water ski. So really, that was the activity. And where would the, where would the family ski? Uh, it's a Miami Ski Club. And who would go to the ski club? Uh, myself, the kids. Sometimes Noel would stay back with Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer would not go, and Fotis would go. And during this trip, did Jennifer discuss her relationship with Mr. Dulos with you? She did. Objection. Well, at this time, did Jennifer discuss her relationship with Mr. Dulos with you? The answer is either yes or no. Overruled. Is that a yes? Yes. And what did she tell you? Well, what did she tell you about the relationship? I'll rephrase. What did she tell you about the relationship? Jackson. Well, that question is very broad. I'll call for an answer that could be a narrative 
So the court is going to sustain the objection, but not allow, but allow you to pursue the line. You mentioned earlier that Jennifer had found out about the affair. Do you recall testifying to that? Yes. What did Jennifer say to you about the affair when you were in Miami? Objection. Well, that's going to be overruled. Uh, she told me she believed that Fotis was having an affair. Did she say why she believed that? Uh, she just said she had this feeling he's been acting weird. And I didn't really believe her at first. When you say you didn't really believe her, what do you mean by that? At that time, I had a good relationship with Fotis, and I believed him to be an honest guy. And I couldn't imagine him having an affair where there's five little kids involved. So how, what did you say to her? I said no. Objection. Ground. But what this witness said is not hearsay. Sir, do you see what's depicted on the screen behind you? Uh, yes. Is that the top half of the document that you see that day? Yes. I would ask at this time if you can stand up and read it. I'll publish it to the jury, please. Sure. Starting at the top line. Uh, some of the words I can't make up. Okay, if you can, please, if you could start with the... Uh, Friday, 524, uh, 2019. And on here on the left? And it says 1 a.m. And could you and read what is said right next, what is written right next to 1 a.m.? Uh, I, I really can't make it out, man. Okay, and what about right below 1 a.m.? What is uh, there? It's, uh, 6 o'clock. And then J. Michelle uh, DEPT with her. Uh, and below that, 640 wake up, alarm. And then took shower together, dress, jeans, lucky plus blue shirt, uh, coffee and cereal. Uh, brought computer to office. And over here on the right far side, what does that say? It's like a Mishi. I can't make up this word. Uh, doing juice bulk. And underneath that, please, starting with the next uh, line. This is seven office. Uh, 7.15, Kent, 7.30, uh, Mishi left, 8.27, uh, Andrea call, spoke briefly, uh, I can't make up this mark here, Mishi back, office and kitchen, 
and it's uh, like eight fifty. Kent left. The nine, and then we're uh, ten. Work on reviewing. Uh, can't make out this uh, word here, but it's uh, uh, specification. And, and budget, Mishi and Andy covered our uh, drafts. Uh, continuing over to this this side, uh, looks like either eight o'clock or nine. Uh, can't make up that uh, word called and. Mishi took, uh, can't make that out either, to Hutch and Aqua's supermarket. Your Honor, um, if the witness cannot read something, I, I, this, it's obviously it's whoever's handwriting it is, to have this witness interpret it, he's misreading what the document is, and I'm not sure him reading it is making it any clearer, if not more obscure, by misstating words that at least I think I know what they are. So I have to object to this procedure. If it was a clear document, it's one thing. If it's clarified by someone who knows what's on the document, that's, that's, that's one thing as well. But to have this witness read things, if he said he did not and couldn't make it out, then I'd be fine. If he's reading something, saying it out loud, and it's not correct. How do I cross-examine on that since I don't, this is not my client's handwriting, so. Well, first, 